none other than Freddie Johnson. And I've said it once, I've said it a hundred times that Freddie is one of the best storytellers uh, ever and uh, a, a treasure here at Buffalo Trace Distillery. So, Freddie, how are you doing? Tim, I'm doing pretty good. What a beautiful day to be out doing something like this. A little bit of a different view of Buffalo Trace Distillery. Um, but when you talked about, uh, let's do something that captures a little bit of the history. Uh, I couldn't think of a better place than right here on the bank of the river. I don't think we've ever shot from this angle before. Nope. So what I want you to try to do uh, is I want you to join me uh, in a journey. So we're going to start off by saying, try to imagine it's the 17 and 1800s. Thomas Jefferson will be the governor of Virginia. And we are now standing in Virginia. Hasn't even been developed. Of course, the river's been here all along, all right? And if we look where Buffalo Trace is today, this is today and tomorrow, all right? So if somebody says, are we live? Obviously, we're alive, right? <laughs> yeah, we're definitely live. <laughs> all right, so that is Buffalo Trace Distillery today, okay? But in the 1700s, two brothers founded this site, Willis and Hancock Lee. They created a little settlement called Leestown. And a lot of people today don't realize where the Leestown Road between Frankfurt and Lexington comes from. The settlement was called Leestown. Over a thousand people were in and around this area and they were making hooch. E.H. Taylor is involved in the development of this area and where Buffalo Trace sits today used to be a very quaint little distillery that E.H. Taylor bought, late 1700s, and he modernizes it. He actually tears the original distillery down and rebuilds it. He builds a distillery, beautiful, um, brick, mortar, and stone, aesthetically pleasing to the community's eye. He puts in column stills. Lightning strikes it, burns it down. He's totally upset. He rebuilds the whole thing in less than a year, all right? Mid-1860s, he's back up and running again, making hooch again, and guess what? The first shipments of whiskey down to New Orleans comes from right here where we're standing, okay? That rye whiskey went to a little coffee house down in New Orleans in the French Quarter, and a bartender down there by the name Freddie's gonna continue on with the story. If you're just joining us, um, we're right here on the Banks of the Kentucky River on the back side of the distillery with Freddie Johnson. All righty. Right. Okay, okay. So, what actually happens here, Thomas Handy substitutes brandy with rye whiskey and the Sazerac cocktail, and the Sazerac cocktail is born. So, the rye whiskey for, it's really kind of cool. Now, try to imagine this. At the same time this is going on, a couple of, uh, French families were influential in the development of this territory. One was a general in the revolution, General Lafayette. So Fayette County, Lexington, Kentucky was named after him. But the other family is the same family that today owns the French International Banks of Bourbon. It was the Bourbon family. And this territory went from Fincastle County, Virginia to Bourbon. So that's how the taste of bourbon got started. So now you've got this cool tasting whiskey that doesn't have a name except darn good. And that's <laughs> darn good whiskey coming out of that location. All right. So it becomes known as Bourbon County whiskey referencing this part of the territory. All right. Later on, county gets dropped from the name, hence Bourbon whiskey. And this territory known as Bourbon County, Virginia, becomes the Commonwealth of Kentucky as we know it today. You got to make it out of here. So there's a demand for it. So what do you do? You build a flatboat. We're all right here on the bank of the Kentucky River. All right. You build that flatboat, put 10 barrels of whiskey on that flatboat. Remember, a full barrel of whiskey is 550 pounds. We push you out here into the river. Something interesting about the Kentucky and the Tennessee rivers, they flow north instead of south. There are only a handful of rivers in the world that do that. The other famous river is the Nile in Egypt. All right. We push you out into the river. Now, you have to shoot rapids on the Kentucky River, the Ohio River, and the Mississippi River. And if you've ever been down to Louisville on Whiskey Row, on the, on the old bourbon trail uh, scenario, 
When you look across the bank from Louisville to the other side over in Indiana, it's a mile across to the other side. The Mississippi is two miles across. So you're on a flat boat with 10 barrels of whiskey, 5,000 pounds of whiskey on a wooden raft you've built yourself, shooting rapids, navigating the river, and guess what? That's not your worst nightmare, all right? You had river pirates waiting for you all up and down the river, okay? Try to imagine what this journey must have been like. If you decided to do this, guess what? You're gone away from your family for two years. It's gonna take you five to seven months just to get down there. You're gonna go buy a bunch of taverns and saloons. You're gonna sell your barrels of whiskey. That's where tap houses came in. People would come into those locations with jugs, like you do growlers with beer today. They would tap into your barrel of whiskey, get a jug of whiskey, pay the proprietor. You and your buddies, you're gonna get the strongest, fastest horses you can to get out of Dodge. Why? Because everybody knows you got two big wads of money in your pocket. You got to get up through the Natchez Trail, yeah, and you got to outrun those other folks that were pursuing you. So you ready for this? Rafts go down, but horses come back. And all of a sudden, horse racing replaces dog racing in Kentucky. So if you've ever wondered how Kentucky became the horse racing capital with the thoroughbred horses, it's because of these strong, fast horses that were coming up through here, and they were feeding on the I don't know anything about you. You can't text them and tell them everything's going pretty cool right now. They had no earthly idea what's going on. So you know that's where that, uh, that, the title for that song came from. I bet many of you haven't even heard it. Uh, the song was written by one of the guys that had made that journey and he gets back home after two years and uh, his buddy comes along and uh, the guy is inspired to write the song. The title of the song was, How Come My, Bo My Dog Don't Bark When You Come Around. Uh -huh. So, yeah, kind of interesting. It's the oldest continually operating distillery in the United States. We're in the midst of a $1.2 billion expansion. So now you can see the impact of technology. So on the back of the old distillery, back of the old distillery, we have put in new cookers, okay? Uh, we've got uh, dryers going in. Uh, we are redoing the way that we mill the grain. Okay, we're, we're enhancing the technologies. Uh, we are currently pulling, we pull about two million gallons of water out of the river. As long as we don't contaminate that water, guess what? We're free to use the water, okay? We just have to return the water back to the river at surface temperature or cooler, and uh, all is well. So this is the water treatment plant over here on the other side of the distillery, and across through this area is actually where the buffalo swam across, hence the name Buffalo Trace Distillery. This is the navigational route of the buffalo through this part of Kentucky. It's really kind of cool, but it's just a pleasant way of looking at what's going on. The motto of the distillery is remember this change. New technology that's so integrated into the original structure that it's hard to even imagine the change that is taking place right now at Buffalo Trace Distillery. So I hope, I hope that this gives you another little snapshot of Buffalo Trace Distillery from another perspective and you get a greater appreciation for that bottle when you reach and pick it up off the shelf in the store. That's, I, I love that story, Freddie. And um, again, we got some traffic here, but uh, just standing on the banks of the Kentucky uh, really puts a, a lot of emphasis on why this river is so important and why it's so important to uh, bourbon. So it's, it's really great to get that, get that story. We've got a bunch of questions. I'm going to ask you a few. <laughs> a bunch of questions. I'm going to ask you a few. I know we're, uh, we're, we may have some uh, connection issues we're hearing, but uh, I think we're, we're going to roll with it. But Jordan Hill on Facebook asks you, you know, what's, what's the biggest growth you've seen at Buffalo Trace over the years, except maybe said besides the bourbon, but what is the, what's like the big, or is it something else? Um, I think it's the, uh, the interest of the consumers. Uh, I really think that this whole new wave of bourbon demand is based on how bourbon has been presented in Kentucky and getting people excited about coming out and seeing these sites and understanding how the history is so inter intertwined with the development of Kentucky and the industry itself. Uh, it's really pretty cool. So last year alone, uh, we had over 300,000 visitors to Buffalo Trace Distillery. Mm -hmm. uh, during the month of March, right before we shut down, 
we had over 20,000 visitors just in one month. And that's just Buffalo Trace. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you ask me what am I excited about, I get excited about the people that are excited about coming to Buffalo Trace Distillery because we get a chance to tell them a little bit about what we do. And we also tell them, go visit some other sites. Go make Kentucky uh, a destination, not just a part of a trip through this part of the United States. Make it a destination, spend some time here, and take it all in. All right? Just take your time and like a good barrel of bourbon making and uh, this distillery being, you know, the oldest uh, continuously operating distillery too. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So Freddie, Dan Crawford says, how do you like to drink your bourbon? <laughs> Have you ever bourbon? <laughs> Have you ever had that question? Asked yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I do like bourbon. All right. So, uh, so Dan, uh, my preferred way of drinking bourbon is uh, sitting upright in a chair with the glass in my hand. Uh, but every now and then I find myself kind of sliding down out of a chair. You know, that's when I've got a really good bourbon in my One way, you're missing three quarters of the taste profile of your bourbon. So some of it I'll do, I'll do neat. Sometimes I'll chill it down. Sometimes I'll hit it with a little water. Sometimes I'll put some water in my mouth. Sometimes I put a little piece of ice in my mouth and I sip on that same bourbon. And what it does is it cools down the inside of your mouth, which causes the heart to pump blood to your tongue. It's called the lingual artery. And as it gradually warms up in your mouth, it takes that whiskey from nice and cool to you get the fruity sweet flavors, you get the caramel toffee notes, and then all of a sudden the alcohol, you do it playing around with some of your bourbon when you got time. Uh, every now and then I'll get a cigar, and I'll take a puff of a cigar, and that smoke kind of gives you that Scottish peaty kind of a smoky taste. Um, and then sometimes I'll do it with a little bit of ginger ale. Sometimes I'll do it with a little bit of ginger ale. Uh, I love it with uh, ginger ale. I'll do it sometimes with uh, the ginger beer. Depends on which one I'm doing. Um, and you'd be amazed at the flavors. Uh, old fashions in Manhattan's especially with the ginger beer just makes it pop. Mm. So, yeah, so a bunch of different ways. I tell people, don't get stuck in just drinking your bourbon one way. Yeah, I think that's great. And it's a great reminder of Freddy's soda. No, Freddy's old fashioned <laughs> soda. There's a whole soda pretty widely now. So go, yeah. go hunt that down. It makes a, makes a yeah. great ginger and bourbon. So. Yeah. And that's not a, that's not a, that's not a, 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 a Freddy thing where Freddy's getting ready to, uh, go down to the Bahamas or something like that. Uh, it's a legacy that the, uh, the owners of the distillery uh, have allowed me the pleasure of being a part of. Uh, it's set up associated with a 501c3 and part of the proceeds of every case of the Freddy Soda line goes to help us restore historical sites. So Freddy, we're about to wrap this thing up. Uh, every time I come to this site myself, I'm always amazed that I feel like every month or two it, it changes and uh, I can imagine that the changes of this view over the years, you know, like you've explained oh of how the, the river flowed one way and um, all the expansion that's going on now at the distillery itself. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of progress in all in to, uh, all in to make more bourbon, yeah. but uh, I know there's a lot of construction back there right now, the, the, the still house, uh, all the ferment, all the fermenter, Fermenters, Fermenters are done. cookers, cookers, new dry dryers house. coming in, new yep. dry house coming in. Yep. Uh, but when you look at it from the river, what's what's cool about this whole thing, Tim, is uh, I think it's a compliment to the distillery itself. I'm not just bragging on Buffalo Trace Distillery, but they have gone through a lot to keep it aesthetically pleasing to the community. Mm -hmm. And if you'll notice, even though all that technology is being put in there and we're doubling the capacity, uh, just from a viewing standpoint, it still looks like pretty much the same site as it's always been. Mm -hmm. And that's what's cool about what they're doing around here. Uh, they planted over a thousand oak trees around the property mm. just to keep you know, this, this environment pretty much like it is. Yeah, we were talking to Dennis and uh, he, he kind of letting us know about the Arboretum progress and all that kind of stuff. It's, oh, it's really so neat. cool. But it just amazes you that you look and here it's the same river that flowed through here in the 1700s. And here we are standing here today, 2021. Yeah. And the uh, process is still the same. <laughs> the hooch still tastes just as good as it did back then. Maybe even better, okay? Uh, but uh, we're just part of a legacy. And the next journey will take it from where we are. And maybe that whiskey coming out of that site that you're looking at behind me, uh, that'll be the next generation of whiskey. And cool. Yeah, it's really cool. Uh, William Englehart Live says, uh, glad they keep things natural. Keep it as natural as possible over there. And you're right. I mean, just everything they're trying to do there. 
uh, Bill Weiss, or Weiss, sorry. I got to meet him uh, and get a tour in May. He said Eagle Rare is his favorite, I believe. Is Eagle Rare your favorite bourbon? Yeah, Eagle Rare and Weller 12 are my two favorite go-to bourbons. Um, and I can wrap it up with just this first is the price point is one that it doesn't bother me the way my friends drink it. Uh, I only bring out those bottles with people I care about, the people I like, but I want to make a memory. But I always wanted to make it a happy memory. I don't want them to feel intimidated that they're drinking it the wrong way uh, because it destroys the moment. So uh, good bourbon like good friends are hard to find. Uh, so if you do find one, make a memory, sign the bottle and date it, and it becomes a little timeline of your life's journey with friends and family. So thanks a lot, Tim, for letting me be a part of this Whiskey Wednesday. I hope everyone out there enjoys it as much as I enjoy doing them with you. Uh, and y'all get a chance, come stop by and see us at Buffalo Trace or go online to buffalotracedistillery.com and see what we got for you uh, online. That's great. Thank you so much, Freddie. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Got a little traffic here. And also just want to just want to say if, if you guys, if, or if everyone had a little bit of feed problem, we believe it may be because we're on these power lines, uh, something that's a little unpredictable if, if you're having a little bit of feed issues. Uh, it's probably on our end. But anyway, thank you so much, Freddie. Uh, always a pleasure. Thanks, Tam. Yeah.